Hi everyone. Today we are going to talk to a superwoman who is a fund manager investing from her second fund in the future of living well. Previously, she co-founded Food Spotting, acquired by Open Table and then Priceline. She was featured on the cover of Fast Company magazine. She was INC Magazine's 30 Under 30, Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40. She has invested in amazing companies like Wing, Parsley Health, City Block Health, and exited on angel investments like Casper, Fix, Gimlet Media, PopTap. Currently, she's eight months pregnant, and we are so lucky to have her. We have Soraya Darabi, a co-founder and general partner of Trailmix Ventures, now called TMB. Welcome, Soraya. Hi, that's... It made me laugh that um, we listed the accolades and it ends with, and she's eight months pregnant. That should be the biggest accolade, right? Yes, that's the biggest thing. And, and I'm so awake. Lucky. She's awake. Yes, yes. And I'm so lucky that you've given us that time. You're so busy. I wanted to start with the very burning question and the burning issues that's going on right now with the Black Lives Matter movement. And I would definitely want to know your take on, especially when we saw the TechCrunch article came out uh, on Low Tony, that LPs who provide capital to VCs need to start incorporating diversity mandates. So they are a very small pool of capital in diversity and focus fund mandates. So how do you navigate the world of institutional LP dynamics when women are mostly put into the diversity or focus fund mandates? Well, there's a lot of questions rolled up in one. Uh, first of all, I'm a big fan of Low and everything that he's done with Plexo Capital. We were on the phone on Friday, right before that article came out. And he's pretty modest. He didn't, he didn't even tell me that article was coming out, um, but I'm so glad he wrote it. It's something a lot of us who've been passionate about parity and diversity in venture capital for some time have been talking about behind closed doors. And the topic of hand uh, that he addressed in his article um, is the fact that there's really no accountability or transparency from the part of LPs into how diverse their portfolio of fund managers is. And the reason this is important is because we know the dire statistics. We know that women receive only 2.2% of all venture dollars. And they are talking about women founders of their startups. And then within that, you know, black women founders, forget about it. They're getting less than 0.4%. So why? You know, it begs the question, why? What's, what's going on? Because, you know, black women, for instance, start 1,400 companies in the U.S. every single day. They just right. tend to start LLCs as opposed to Delaware C-Corps. And for those of you who know the industry jargon, most venture-backed companies are Delaware C-Corps. So why is this inverse sort of situation happening? And, and it can really be rooted back to, well, where do venture funds get their capital to begin with? And we pitch pension funds. Sometimes we pitch firefighter pension funds, policemen and police women pension funds. Sometimes we pitch endowments, Ivy League endowments, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Sometimes we pitch, um, you know, more broadly endowments for entire countries, <laughs> like the country of Singapore. And I think that while all these institutions are doing a phenomenal job in some ways, you know, managing their own stakeholders' expectations, and their stakeholders tend to be donors or people benefiting from the pensions, they're not asking themselves the hard questions, which is, does my portfolio of fund managers with whom I invest reflect the overall ethics and values of the institutions that I'm representing? And then furthermore, there's very little accountability or transparency as to who are deploying those checks on behalf of the institutions and endowments so that we as venture fund managers who are then pitching them in return for capital have an understanding, oh, actually this, this endowment's really, really friendly to women fund managers because they've backed 10 of us before. Those statistics are really hard to come by. Absolutely. You can sort of find them mm. sometimes in pitch book or prequin or you know, occasionally through back channel doors, but there's not like one central database that says there is a diversity mandate, which Lowe referenced in his article. Within that diversity mandate, they're looking for parity. 50% of their funds have to go equally to, the, to both genders. And then within the gender diversity, they actually care a lot about um, managers of color, people of color representing them, so that in turn, there's a second mandate where those emerging diverse fund managers are then reallocating capital to diverse founders. We haven't seen that happen yet in our industry. 
we're starting to see a little bit of reckoning around the fact that there needs to be more partners or more decision makers at venture funds that look like you or I, but we're not quite seeing it at that next tier up yet. Yeah. And I think that the moment the industry starts to ask these tough questions is the moment that the accountability begins. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. Completely agree what you said. And we like to hold our guests also accountable for all this diversity mandates. You tweeted um, yesterday actually about, um, you know, um, about an article that's about you, that is there a diversity on the cap table, on the founding team and the advisory board. And I think that resonated with so many people. Now, yeah. tell us about the diversity in your fund and the portfolios that you are investing. Oh, absolutely. I think transparency is key and it begins with, you know, be the change, absolutely. right? So at uh, TMV, our fund, um, we are a partnership of five. The two general partners are women. We own our holding company, Marina and I, 100% uh, ourselves. And within the holding company, there are different funds. We're on our second fund, as you mentioned. And we have, um, outside of ourselves, um, three partners, Julia, Darshan, and Evan, um, who have very distinct and different backgrounds. Uh, Julia is phenomenal, former Carnegie Hall uh, pianist turned banker, turned CEO of a startup. Uh, she is Russian and um, an expert in all things electronic vehicles, so still right. sustainability and mobility. Darshan um, has a different background. He's Indian American, has founded two companies, both of which exited successfully. One was venture backed and one he self financed, um, one in enterprise software and one in education technology. And Evan has sold two startups himself by the time he was 30 most notably a, an app that all of my Gen Z relatives know called Swift Media, which was the first emoji keyboard. Um, outside of those three partners, there is Molly, our associate, and Molly comes from Connecticut. And then we have um, the newest member of our team overseeing platform while she's at Harvard Business School, Keita Burke-Williams, uh, who is an African-American MBA platform analyst, uh, analyst slash intern. Um, depending on how you phrase it. So that's what our team looks like. Um, we intentionally- That's a great hire, diverse team. I think so. I think we can do yeah. better. Um, yeah. We have had in the past team members who represent the Latinx community, uh, one Asian American team member who's gone on to work for First Round Capital, which we're so proud of. Um, but believe me, as we expand the team and, and as we continue to hire, uh, we're doing so with a keen eye towards a, as well diversity and parity. And then among our portfolio of 26 companies, 51% uh, of those companies were female founded. And with a CEO that is a woman as well. That's really important to us to state 51% because venture capital overall is only doling out 2.2% of their dollars to women. We're pretty proud of the fact that we're 51%. We never wanted a gender lens fund. Mm. We didn't want a fund necessarily that said we only invest in women because why do we have to single gender out? Yeah. We just internally have a mandate that's important for us to follow. 11% uh, of our founders are black, including two black women and one black man. Um, that's amazing. Thank you. Well, I don't know if it's amazing. But, but definitely better than other uh, funds. Better, I'd say more transparent than other funds. Yes, that's important. 7% Latinx. Um, and this is interesting. 10% of our founders identify as LGBTQ. That's and when I say identify, they're publicly identifying, we would never ask. So this mm -hmm. is something that is important to them. 50% of our general partnership also identifies that way. So, you know, these statistics they're asking me about and putting me on the spot with, by the way, are great. And I only wish that when I talk to LPs, I could be as direct with them yeah. and say, yeah. well, talk to me about what I, what I have said in the past. <laughs> I said this to a sovereign fund last week. What I have said in the past is, um, have you ever backed a diverse emerging fund manager before? And you'd be surprised at how few first have to think about it. And, and by the way, I'm almost inevitably always asking, you know, two men this question. You'd be surprised at how many have to think about it. They pause and then they say, well, we're not public about our overall support yes, for various that's funds. A problem. <laughs> uh, we tend to keep that list to ourselves. That's usually the standard answer. Yeah. Whereas you'd think if there was one that they were particularly proud of, they'd say, well, we, we keep the list, you know, private for the most part, but 
you might know, and I'll, I'll hypothetically name some funds I think very highly of Kindred Ventures or Equal Ventures yeah. or Dream Machine or, or Boom Capital, TMV. You might, you might have heard of them. Um, and I wish that that weren't the instance. I, I wish that we were hearing them proudly list off a soliloquy of great funds um, that I could recognize and, and then therefore feel like I'm in a safe space when I'm pitching them. Yeah, very true. So let's talk about your journey as an emerging fund manager, especially navigating the space of LP mandates. Can you elaborate about the new market opportunities for emerging fund manager like you who, when you started to create your own fund, how was the journey and how the market has changed in the last five years for many seed funds like you? Well, I'll start with when I began investing. So mm -hmm. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I was, I was a product person that you referenced at a startup that was acquired by Facebook. And then I, I co-founded a startup that was acquired twice. And then I started a, far, a startup that sort of flopped a little bit. Um, but we had great backers. And coming out of that experience, I was also angel investing um, along the way. I began angel investing in 2010. 2009. 2009. So I've been angel investing for 11 years. I never created an angel list page. I never publicly put it on my Twitter profile, never announced that I was an investor because I had such massive imposter syndrome. I thought you could only call yourself an investor if you had one skyrocket hit. You were early in Instagram or Twitter because that was sort of the modus operandi when I began angel investing. I was surrounded by the early guys and gals, mostly guys in Twitter and Uber. And I just thought, well, Will I feel sheepish yeah. if I put on my profiles, I'm an angel in companies that I think are phenomenal. You referenced a few of, the, of my exits um, since like Gimlet and Casper and Fitz. So I stayed very quiet about it for about mm -hmm. eight years. And um, a few years ago, uh, I had dinner with um, a woman that I went to college with, whom I've known and respected for now 17 years. And we had stayed in light touch since Georgetown, our undergrad days, um, but our careers were wildly disparate. So whereas I had this entrepreneurial background and, and very decent deal flow from being um, a woman in the web 2.0 scene, doing product development and, and later you know, starting and founding my own startups, she um, went a different route entirely. She was inspired by her grandmother who mm. started a shipping family within her family, which is um, six generations of maritime shipping. She's Greek. Mm. And her grandmother, when she was in high school, set up Bloomberg terminals in her room. Wow. And, mm -hmm, and taught my partner at TMV, Marina, Marina Hachipateras, how to start reading the markets. Mm. And Marina cool. went after college to the Merchant Marines Academy to get her Abel Siemens license. And I think that name is hilarious. <laughs> and then moved to South Korea to work on a ship that her family built. Their maiden voyages for their ships are usually from Korea and the family gets very emotional as they see one of their ships launch into the ocean. And so Marina and I were actually catching up a few years ago because we had reconnected at a friend's comedy show and Marina had to leave a little bit early. We were asking her why. She said, oh, well, very modestly, I'm ringing the bell at the New York Stock Exchange tomorrow morning. <laughs> she was taking her family business public after working for them for more than a decade. Wow, Across that's great. Like corporate development, procurement, and investor relations. And she led the IR Roadshow, raising about $135 million for a company that now has a market cap of about a billion. So Marina and I went to dinner to celebrate each, each other's accomplishments, which I think, by the way, women, and generally exactly. people should do more often. When your friend has a big win in life, Ask them if you can take them to dinner and just say congratulations. That was a big, big feat. And so we were, we were having one of these kind of, you know, mutual respect dinners. And she began to talk to me about her family office that she was setting up uh, now that the company had gone public. And she said, do you have any interest in helping us make investment decisions? And I said, maybe. Do you have any interest in spinning out and uh, starting a fund? Um, because I think that your institutional capital know-how. Mm -hmm. And your ability to manage stakeholders with this ex extreme level of professionalism, not to mention your background doing direct investments at the growth stage, coupled with my access to founders who are pre-product market fit, you know, idea on a napkin, earliest infancy, whatever you want to call it, 
my access to those founders, if we marry our two experiences, that creates a very nice hard shell around what could eventually become a, a fully incubated fund. And yeah. so she agreed. And then we took the ultimate risk. We deferred salaries for about three years. Wow. So you have, it's, it's not spoken about enough. And, and Lowe does That's touch on this true. article. But you really, <laughs> it's not easy to start a fund unless you're prepared to put it all out there. You're prepared to take a lot of risk with your own savings. Not everybody has these savings, so I'm not yeah. assuming they do. And there's um, GP commitment. Well, there's a lot of things, right? So yeah. there's, there's, they always say, um, you know, your, your most precious commodity is your bandwidth. Hmm. So it's, it's deferring opportunities. It's opportunity cost. It's the capital it takes to um, invest in yourself and create the framework for a company. Because hmm. really, it's really hard to kind of raise quote unquote seed capital for a fund. You just need to start to fork over money for things like legal and design and et cetera. Office space if you decide to go that route. Yeah. And then yes, and then a GP commitment. And in our first fund, Marina and I set out to raise $10 million. It, it wasn't easy. It took us 18 more, 19, 20 months more than the average. And we raised from too many LPs to even name. I'm so embarrassed at how many LPs we had in our first fund. But it ended up being a blessing in disguise because it taught us how to go out and mm. properly do a fund roadshow and why minimizing the number of LPs is a good thing, <laughs> just something we're emphasizing in our second fund. Um, and then yes, and you, then you need to have the general partnership commit. And in our first fund, our commitment was pretty substantial. Uh, well more than industry average in terms of percentiles. It was double digit percentile. And, um, and then you have to kind of, you know, vote with your own dollars and be as patient as your LPs are for that, for that capital to materialize over time. So luckily our first fund had some really great outliers, some demonstrable wins. And we've turned down now five acquisition offers among a wow. portfolio of five. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. It's great. But the, the, the industry shifts, as you know, on a year end and year out basis. And so we've modeled and, and eyed our second fund differently now that it's mm -hmm. a bigger vehicle. It's a more defensive measure. We're making fewer investments. We're writing larger checks. We're leading and co-leading rounds exclusively. And, um, and all of this wouldn't be possible had Marina and I not taken that risk back in 2016 to go out and venture out on our own. Very true. You talked about multiple things, and uh, I wanted to ask you one more question about uh, the imposter syndrome. But before going that, since we are talking about LPs, I really want to know about how do you tackle the liquidity position? Because specifically with COVID-19, whatever is going on, how do you approach the liquidity position to any of the incoming LPs? When you say the liquidity, oh, you mean, you mean how do I tell my LPs when to expect liquidity? Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, venture capital is one asset class, which is also cyclical, the boom bust cycle. But the lock-up period for limited partners is as long as 15 to 20 years, unlike hedge funds and others. Not, not ours. I mean, we, yeah. have, we have a standard 10 on 2. Um, 10 on 2 means it's a 10-year fund with the extension of two years potentially. Um, we promise our LPs that we'll make all of our investments within four years. Oh, that's our first, right. all of, I'd say all of the first time investments, we did follow ons, but all the first time investments were made within, uh, two years and 11 months. So just, just shy of three years. Um, well, we put in precautions. I'll be, like I said, I think transparency is really essential in this industry and people don't mm. talk about it enough. Uh, we occasionally put together terms for founders that have a lot of, uh, momentum up behind them, but maybe not enough da data or traction to make us feel safeguarded. And we say that at a certain valuation, if we're going to be the first seven figure check into their company, mm. we're going to take a board role and really roll up our sleeves and, and act like an extension of their team, which is our promise. We promise to be Jerry Maguire meets Aaron Brockovich meets Mr. Rogers. <laughs> and by the way, I'd like to throw in some diversity into that, that, that metaphor. So I've been trying to think lately, who's, who is that character? that perseveres for you, um, that acts like you are his or her only client, uh, who's kind and informative, but ultimately your teacher. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll crowdsource this one. And I'm, I'm curious yeah. what your listeners have to say, but I'm, I'm all over. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so that's our promise to founders. And then in return, we say, we don't intend 
to transfer your shares, just so you know. But a bigger fund may come around. And hypothetically, these bigger funds look like hedge funds or multi-billion dollar venture funds that have gone downstream and entered into the early stage of investing. And they're known for legaling up and creating powerful terms that recap a situation in their favor. Yeah. So at a certain valuation, which by the way, could take you two years or 10 years, we'd like to reserve the option to be able to transfer some of our shares. Mm -hmm. And that helps to protect our LPs because we tell them when we have that option, we may opt into it, which provides you with liquidity sooner than you would expect at these larger sort of 10-year lockup funds. Because mm. the larger funds, as we mentioned before, tend to be backed almost exclusively yeah. by endowments and, and, and pensions. And, yeah. and they want that long lockup. They don't yeah. want to put the cyclical markets. They want the, the sort of invest and hold strategy. Mm. But when you're investing on behalf of family offices, uh, fund of funds, multifamily offices and foundations, which is by the way, the majority of my LP base, then you have to think differently and you have to be attuned mm -hmm. to what they want. And I have two clients at the end of the day. I'm a service provider yes. and I provide a service to my investors, my LPs, to be a good steward of capital and to be responsible and to give them a return on their money. And I'm, I'm aiming for a 5X net at bar minimum. That's my floor. And for my other clients, arguably equally important. I think so. We think so. Those are our founders. And we have a responsibility to them when we invest and skirt other people off the cap table. Our responsibility to them is to get them to their finish line. Whatever we determine together, that finish line looks like. So it's, it's a balancing act of making sure that, you know, your terms are not taking advantage of founders in any way, which is really crucial to me because every partner on our team has a founder exit behind them. So we know what the journey is like and we have a lot of empathy for that journey. But at the same time, we have to be savvy about how this mm. industry can be really cutthroat. And right. there, there's, not a, there's not really a lot of room for Pollyannas. <laughs> that's true, that's true. And I, I like what you, when you touch base about the imposter syndrome, I think we women don't do enough the job of telling our stories. And that's one of the reasons I created SheVC. So for, for you, you pioneered social media for New York Times in 2007. You raised more than $50 million for your own endeavors and helped raise over $200 million for the founders you have invested in. And- 250 million now. So it's not, awesome, that's now $250 million and 20 plus more angel investments. So how, so my million dollar question is how difficult was it to get into the venture capital industry for someone like you. And by someone like you, it means people who have so much of achievements. And I, that's why I introduced you as a super woman. So how difficult was it? First of all, that's very kind. Um, I'm a pregnant superwoman right now. Uh, and <laughs> hopefully when my daughter comes into the world, she feels more confident and more empowered than I did growing up because it all starts with childhood. Yeah. And I've come to realize I've been thinking a lot about what it's gonna be like to raise a little woman in this world. And I think if I had given her one gift and, and I was only able to choose which, which gift that would be, it'd be the gift of confidence for so many That's reasons. That's amazing, actually. <laughs> the gift of confidence. So, fingers crossed. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big and it's a loaded question. Mm. Sometimes I tell this story, which is that there were two men who looked out for me early on in my career when I was in my 20s, both of whom taught me how to invest and I'm grateful to them in different ways. This world is complicated and nuanced, and both of those men have since left their VC firms because of Me Too situations. So then I retroactively ask myself, would they have helped me had I not been dot, dot, dot? But I'm grateful for their help, right? It's, it's, it's so complicated. And then when it came time to formally interview for the big firms, which I did, I interviewed for a big firm on Sand Hill Road, I was told I wasn't a cultural fit. Um, and that, that circled back to me via the recruiter who, who found me for the role, who remains a very dear friend. Shout out to Mercedes, Mercedes Chatwell Taylor, who found me at age 26 and noticed amazing. that I was running. <laughs> She's amazing. She noticed that I was running with a pack of wolves, like really savvy tech founders who were building billion dollar companies. And I was one of the only women that they would invite on their fancy ski trips or um, to you know hackathons in Brooklyn. And she said, you have unique access, let's get you into venture capital. And it just didn't stick. Um, I just you know, wasn't the norm. 
uh, I didn't have the credentials that they were looking for potentially, um, or maybe maybe you needed a certain last name and a certain pedigree to make it into those firms. There's a lot of nepotism in our industry as well. Potentially, I didn't interview the right way. But wow. despite, despite all of the sort of media accolades that you mentioned before, and despite having had, um, you know, not one but two startup exits behind me, I wasn't able to get a job at those, you know, blue chip Silicon Valley Sand Hill Road uh, firms. <laughs> Wow. Uh, so many stories, so many stories, so many stories. So obviously I didn't feel like that was a cultural fit mm. for me. True. It goes two ways, right? Yes. And I think the reason that I started my own fund is because I was feeling dejected by this whole experience. And I had lunch at the house of a wonderful and powerful New York City VC. And I'll, ask, I'll ask him for permission to share his name at some other point. Sure. And he and his wife sat down with me, I'll never forget it, over veggie sandwiches. <laughs> and he said, do you really think this is an apprenticeship business? And those words yeah. stuck with me. That's so and I went true. Home. That's so true. Oh, my God. I went home and I asked myself, is this an apprenticeship business? Is it? It could be. I think for some people it is. But certainly for me, it didn't feel that way. And so that's when I... I so got the whiteboard and I started imagining what a different type of early stage fund in New York City could look like. One with diversity at the helm, mm. one with a mission to back purpose-driven companies, what we call the future of living well at Trail Mix, TMV, um, and, and a company started by operators who love being operators who want to back operators. And I'm not saying that we wrote this script but I'm also saying that this script is hard to find. And when you say authentically to a founder, like we are going to roll up your sleeves, we have been where you have been, and we're not promising to take you through your IPO, although we have growth experience on our team. But we promise that we won't rest until you have top tier institutional capital mm. marking us up because we're so aligned with you and we're so excited about what you're building that we want to be building it with you. That, that is the most important time for a startup, right? At a, such an early stage. We believe from our own experience of having built seven companies among the five partners, we believe that the first 18 months of infancy are the most vulnerable and crucial times for any business. Yes. Yeah. And so why, why, why would you take passive capital? Mm. Why would you take capital from people who won't promise they'll follow on because that's a signaling risk or at least give you a pathway to how they follow on. Why would you take capital from a firm that does a hundred investments a year when you could work with a firm that does two to four? I mean, but when you're a founder and you have these fancy, fancy names coming to your demo days saying, we'll give you this outrageous valuation that you don't yeah, yeah. deserve, potentially don't yet deserve, um, <laughs> because we are who we are, that's hard to turn down. At the yeah. same time, having been in their shoes, I will always go back and look, look for the scrappy early stage funds to partner with. Yeah. I love your answer. I think uh, you, you touch base the, my last question, um, which I wanted to ask you also, but you know, venture capital is such a bro industry and it has not been disrupted. So as we are seeing more people bringing movement into this industry, how do you see all these biases and prejudices that gets played in the past and now coming in effect for people like you who are catalysts for change? And you know, it's a very transactional industry, as you said, but is it an apprenticeship industry? So especially in an industry where few people make a company, almost like startup, and there's no human resource system to talk about any harassment against that power play. What are your, like, as you said, like, you know, when I'm thinking about creating a dream VC fund or a dream fund, how it should be, what do you think about the future and how it want, how you want to see it? Well, that's a powerful question. Well, especially for your daughter. <laughs> all of us. Yeah. Gayatri, you, you, you recently joined a group that Marina and I began three years ago called Transact. Yeah. And we began it with two of our friends. Um, Alexia of Dream Machine. I'm, an, I'm small, but I'm an LP in her fund. And then um, Heather Hartnett of Human Ventures. And the four mm -hmm. of us started a, a Zoom call, not unlike this, to just talk about 
pain points or areas in which we feel like we've been differentiated for better or for worse because of our gender. And then we thought about it and we said, oh, maybe we should invite our friend Sarah Kuntz to Clio Capital. Or maybe we should invite our friend, boom, 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 boom. And today we welcomed our 50th member into the WhatsApp group. Yeah. It remains a weekly conference call for women emerging fund managers around the world. We have a fund in Dubai, a fund in Hong Kong, and a fund in Venezuela, all of whom participate very actively. And when I think about where venture capital is headed, I would like to see Transact, our group hmm. of women supporting women globally to help each other raise funds, manage our funds well, access great deal flow, and, and provide you know, infotainment to one another. I would like to see that expand where gender doesn't become a part of why people describe our group. It's just a matter of emerging fund managers, bar none, helping one another elevate in success. And when I began in VC, there was probably there were five maybe funds that everyone could reference easily um, if pressed. Hmm. And now there are 1,200 seed funds just in market. Oh, yeah. So the industry is absolutely changing. Hmm. And you have two choices. You can try to fight against that change and scream, we're the best, um, and deny other people help along the way. And deny, you know, your sisters or your brothers a hand up as they're mm -hmm. trying to create their own destiny. Or you can say, maybe the model of the industry is about to change. Maybe the language around this industry is about to change. And I want to be part of the group that embraces that change and rides the tide together. And so that's, that's what I look forward to in the future. Uh, I look forward to absolutely all the things that we talked about, equality, first and foremost. Um, you referenced it as being bro-ish. It goes so far and beyond that. You know, the classic Upton Sinclair quote. Yeah. But I think the way to pave the future forward is to just accept that a lot of this change is not in our hands. But what we can control is how hard do we work? How hard do we work for our founders? How hard do we work for our LPs? Do we operate with integrity? And if we say that we're in the business of disrupting industries, then how do we disrupt ourselves? That's great. Thank you, Soraya, for your time and congratulations on your baby. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks, I need it. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure to be here and I'm a big fan of what you're creating.